Welcome to another edition of the Wolverine.com podcast here on the Wolverine.com. Or if you're watching on YouTube or listening in our podcast feed, we're happy to have you here. Uh, here on Sunday morning, the morning after Michigan grabs another victory, moves to 9 1 on the season, 21 17 win at Penn State on Saturday. And, and Ryan and I came back, um, of course, joined today by uh, former Michigan Wolverine defensive lineman Ryan Van Bergen, as we are on all of these weekend podcasts here. We came back and we did a quick reaction. It's kind of somewhat in the moment. I think we went live maybe 15 to 20 minutes after a Saturday's game, but we're back here on Sunday morning uh, now that we've had a day to sit on it, to absorb uh, everything that happened in Happy Valley. Uh, Ryan, I guess... First of all, welcome, and second of all, how do you feel about that game now that we're, you know, a little more than you know, 16, 17 hours removed from it? Well, thanks for having me, uh, and I feel good. I feel like that's a win that some previous teams, you know, you go down by four points, they come down, they tie it up, and then all of a sudden you have the strip in the red zone, and all these things working against you on the road in a big game, and there's been previous teams that would not have responded the way that this team responded. So I feel like you have to be excited about and, and proud of how this team battled. It wasn't the prettiest win. It was a slugfest. You know, it was not um, a lot of explosiveness and fireworks, but uh, it was a good win for Michigan football. And it's a win in November. It's a win on the road. And it's something that we have struggled with. So let's celebrate a little bit, feel good about it, and look forward to what's coming next. Yeah, and this was a game, too, where – I definitely wanted it to percolate a little bit. Just let it sit. Go back, look at some things. If this felt like a game that Michigan rarely wins, you're not wrong. Um, the The win on Saturday at Penn State snapped what was a 16-game losing streak to teams ranked in the AP Top 25 when facing a fourth-quarter deficit. So if you felt like, here we go again, same old Wolverine, same old Harbaugh, can't close out a big game, can't, can't make a play when it matters, you were justified in feeling that way. It hasn't happened a ton as of late. But you know, to Michigan's credit, this was probably their best winning time performance, quote unquote, uh, under Jim Harbaugh. Um, you know, you give up the, the sack fumble, or you give up a touchdown, you come back, you sack fumble, uh, defense holds strong, uh, holds I mean, holding Penn State to a field goal after that fumble was was so huge, so critical, uh, and them getting that win on Saturday, and then you know, for as much crap and deservedly so that Josh Gaddis has taken as offensive coordinator and maybe not being able to be a little more aggressive and being able to dial something up late in a game that helps Michigan win. You know, they called probably the best. I mean, they called one of the best play calls they've had all season. And, and Eric all hobbling on a, you know, he's on a bum ankle still. He said after the game, he's still 75, 80%. You could tell he's still, he's still in pain when he's running on it, but that guy helped Michigan get into the end zone on pure, you know, um, you know, adrenaline, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, that guy made a play. And to me, that's kind of emblematic of how the game went for Michigan. It didn't have to look pretty. It, pro it was probably a little bit painful. But at the end of the day, adrenaline and willpower and want to is what got this done for Michigan. And it just... It's so – I understand why it's jarring because we just haven't seen it a ton in these type of moments. Yeah, and it's nice and a testament to the players because, I mean, Roman Wilson too, he's out there with a cast on his wrist and he's catching his first touchdown. Uh, you know, and we break the mold a little bit. And on first and 10 from the red zone, we run a play action, skinny post to Roman Wilson. What? That's that's new and that's exciting. And <laughs> um, Eric All – having the game that he had, you know, I think Andre Anthony still out there banged up. I think McNamara is a little banged up. All these guys are playing hurt. And that's something that, you know, you obviously want to uh, kind of tip your cap, pat them on the back, that type of thing. Um, but not everybody responds the same way when you're hurt. And especially when you're hurt, when you're down, things aren't going your way. It's snowing, it's raining, it's all sorts of things not necessarily going in your favor. And for these guys to show up and, and you know, overcome adversity in a hostile environment, it shows a lot of maturity and it shows, uh, you know, a lot of continuity among this team. There's, there's some simpatico in the locker room that, that I think we've been missing 
for the last few years. And it's exciting to see that. It's just a matter of, is it going to be culture? Obviously, I want to see this year finish up strong. Everybody's excited to see this year finish up. I'm even starting to think about, is this something that's, this is the team's identity and will it last when Hutchinson's gone? Will it last when some of these guys are gone? Because this is the culture of Michigan football that you want to see and what you thought you were getting with Harbaugh. So that part of it, I think we all need to kind of bask in that part of this team of, you know, even after the game, the ESPN person is going up to Harbaugh and asking to talk with him. And he's like, See, I talk to Eric Hall. He's super uncomfortable and super awkward about it, like he always is. But Eric Hall needs the attention, you know, and that's the kind of thing. You see other guys, the Dabo Sweeney's, the Nick Sabins, those types. They get guys that they want to play for them. They want to chest bump. They want to, you know, be a part of the team. And uh, I'm excited to see some of the different things that you're seeing that aren't necessarily right in your face about how together this team is and how they're playing the game. Yeah, let's talk about Cade McNamara and the quarterback situation for a bit because – you know, the elephant in the room all season has obviously been J.J. McCarthy. We didn't see him at all on Saturday for the first time since, I don't know, maybe the Rutgers game. I, I mean, I can't think of the last time that we didn't see J.J. McCarthy on the field. And this wasn't the type of game to do that type of um, you know, quarterback roulette anyways, if, if everyone was healthy. I mean, I think what Cade McNamara has proven over the last several weeks going back to that, um, going back to the Michigan State game is that, you know, right now, if he's healthy and he's able to be on the field, that's your guy. And, you know, the numbers aren't sexy. They rarely are with him. He was 19 for 29, 217 yards, three touchdowns, uh, took a pair of sacks. Obviously, um, that's only five sacks he's taken total on the season. That's I feel like Sean Clifford got hit 15 times in Saturday's game. So credit to Michigan for keeping its quarterback healthy. But, you know, with, with McNamara's performance, again, um, you know, three touchdown passes, that was the third week in a row that he had a you know an ESPN QBR that was over 82. Uh, last three games, 82.3, 82.1, 87.2. You go back and look at a performance that he had uh, against Wisconsin, uh, 17 for 28, 197 yards, two touchdowns, a 91.8 QBR. Um, so what that tells me is, you know, for all the for all the grief that he's taken, um, and, and it's not always pretty, but. You know, Michigan's 9-1 right now, and he's played some of his best games this season when Michigan has needed it the most. And I think you know, for as much of a narrative as the quarterback thing is, and uh, does Michigan have a quarterback to elevate it to the next level? Listen, we'll see what happens when they play a game against Ohio State in a couple weeks uh, and then you know, a potential bowl game. It's, uh, the one thing I will say, um, not to get too off track here, is that win Saturday pretty much, I would think, locks up a New Year's Six Bowl for them. Um, we'll talk about the road ahead here a little bit later on. But the um, fact of the matter is, Cade McNamara, you still have one against Maryland this weekend. But, you know, I think what he's shown is, you know, not necessarily numbers-wise, but in terms of what you're getting out of him when the lights are the brightest, he is playing his best football in these big-time games. He is, and he's consistent. That's one thing that you can't knock him. He always is the same guy coming out to the field. You're not going to see <clears> – <throat> excuse me, I don't think you're going to see anything too uh, out of character for him, positive or negative, when he comes to the field. You're going to get the same product every time you go with McNamara. And I do think it's time to – I've kind of been back and forth of should J.J. play more, should he play less, how should we use J.J. because he's just so dynamic and someone that has a really bright future for us. But uh, I don't have any problem with – us keeping McNamara in the game, keeping him in the rhythm and the flow of this game. Penn State's defense, I stand by it even after yesterday and Friday, that's Penn State's defense outside of maybe our defense is the best defense in the Big Ten. <clears throat> and, um, you know, you don't want to put them and give them a chance, the defense a chance to swing the game by, you know, generating a turnover, scoring on defense, something like that. So I can understand the decision for J.J. not to be in the game. And to be honest, we might see him second half Maryland. I very much doubt you'll see him hardly at all uh, for Ohio State. I um, think he's just right there simmering on the back burner, ready for an opportunity. The other thing will be interesting to see is, is McNamara going to be able to hold the number one spot if he sticks around for the next season? Because I think if McCarthy has another year underneath him, there could be another QB battle next year. And we've kind of been going through those experiences. But, um, you know, McNamara, like you said, sexy is a good word. He's not the sexiest. And he's, uh, you know, he's uh, he kind of goes out there and gets the job done. He's kind of, you know, a blue-collar quarterback, if you want to call him that. And uh, I think that's what Harbaugh likes, though. I don't know that it's what the college football necessarily is trending towards, but 
that's what Harbaugh wants. Harbaugh wants a guy that, you know, has the work shirt and the name and script right here on the side of his shirt and goes to work every day with his lunch in a paper sack. That's what, who our Harbaugh is. So uh be interesting to see more about how Harbaugh and Gaddis form this this quarterback position and what they want and what abilities they want this position to have in order to orchestrate the offense. Yeah, I think you and I may have talked about this before where, um, you know, at, at some point it just has to become clear that the guy that you have on the field is winning you football games and you don't need to don't need to overthink it. Um, so, I mean, at some point it could be against Ohio State, could be in a bowl game. Who knows? J.J. McCarthy being in the football game is going to affect what happens in a game. And to a certain extent, it's, it's <coughs> happened already um, going the other direction, uh, you know, when you see what happened at Michigan State. But Cade McNamara, I mean, when we talk about these debates and, and what, what comes next and who sticks around, who wins the job, at the end of the day, you just kind of have to roll with the guy that wins you football games. Um, you know, they'll settle, they'll settle that. You know, they're they're going to have winter conditioning. They'll have spring football. There's a lot of football to go before they have to make a decision on next year. But in the here and now, Cade McNamara is giving you pretty much everything you could have asked for. I want to flip over to the defensive side of the football and talk about maybe some of the things that you saw. Um, you know, Maybe what's your biggest takeaway about Michigan's defensive performance against Penn State? The stat of the game was what you said it would be. Uh, they're 6-0 and when Jahan Dotson gets into the end zone. They are now 0-4 when Jahan Dotson does not get into the end zone. So you don't want to boil it down. You know, the game of football is not that simple, but boiling it down, that seems like a pretty cut and dry way for Michigan to win this football game. What I'm seeing out of the defense is growth in the secondary. I feel like we're figuring out who we like and where we like them to be. Um, I feel like, you know, McDonald's done a good job of kind of shuffling, rotating, just moving bits and pieces here and seeing how things happen. Um, I've been really surprised with a game we haven't talked about much, Rod Moore. Because uh, I was when we talked Friday, I thought we would maybe potentially move Dax back to safety, bring in another nickel to play underneath or something like that and have Dax kind of shadowing uh, Dotson where he went. But that's not what happened. We actually had uh, – we would let Gray and JT Turner kind of take out, take turns on Dotson, and Rod Moore's kind of the one calling the shots back there, a freshman safety. You know, you look at who's making the adjustments and what, moving their hands and checking things, it's this freshman safety. And I thought he played very well. You know, one thing it's tough to tell because when you've got guys like Ojabo and Hutchinson putting quarterbacks on their back over and over and over again, you don't necessarily get to see what position the safeties are in or, or how they're how they're playing the game. But I'm interested to see how this kid develops because he's a true freshman safety that I feel like is being given the keys a little bit in the secondary. And um, I'm just excited to see him develop. Obviously, if we want to even come close to competing with Ohio State, our secondary needs to have their absolute best game. I mean, Ohio State, watching Ohio State – uh, they have three, four, five receivers that are all four, three guys in the 40 and, and can break it on any play a, at any time. And, oh, by the way, they've got two running backs that are also studs. So uh, our secondary is going to have to be on their P's and Q's in order to even come close to competing with Ohio State. So seeing the growth and development, holding a guy like Jahan Dotson uh, and, and confusing putting Sean Clifford on his back the way we did, that's, so those are all good signs for growth of our defense, especially the passing defense that we have. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard not to look ahead uh, because we know what's on the schedule. We know what comes next. Um, you know, when, when I look at performances that guys like Aiden Hutchinson and David Ojabo had on Saturday and that they continue to have week in and week out, um, you know, those guys are game wreckers. And, and we just talked about how Cade McNamara has only taken five sacks all season. Aiden Hutchinson and, and David Ojabo had five sacks yesterday combined. So... You know, that obviously has ripple effects through the rest of a defense. Um, you know, when you play Ohio State, for all the reasons that you just laid out, the wide receivers, um, the, you know, if nothing else, the quarterback play is usually uh, heady and it knows, you know, the guy knows how to get the ball out and get the ball to his playmakers. Uh, the way you win a game like that is to create confusion and mix up your coverages and have those guys getting in the backfield. So when you look at those ingredients that are in play, do you think that Michigan has enough there? I mean, we, we're probably getting way ahead of ourselves here with you know another game still to go, and, and we'll do those podcasts before Ohio State. But when you look at Saturday, it, and it's tough, it's a tough just juxtaposition, right? Because I think Ohio State scored fifty-two or fifty-six against Purdue, and 
Michigan scored 21 and was in a slugfest on Saturday. So two very different types of games. But when you look at how Hutchinson and Ojabo are wrecking these games, do you think that's something that you know can help Michigan um, have a puncher's chance in that game? Because if those, it feels like if those guys don't play as disruptively as they were Saturday, Michigan probably doesn't have a chance. I would agree with that. I mean, that's the one thing that takes away from your receivers running free downfield is you don't get to see them because you're already been planted. And uh, I think that's something that definitely led to us having success against Dotson and will help us be successful uh, against Ohio State is that you don't have the same amount of time that you've had throughout the entire season with uh, when you play Michigan because we have the two edge rushers. Everybody's got one, but the fact that we have two and they're both leading the Big Ten is insane. And I always say this, and I will take my time to say this now to the listeners, sacks are better than touchdowns. I don't care what anyone says, sacks are always going to be harder to achieve than a touchdown is. So the fact that these guys are accumulating sacks, sacks are second only to turnovers, in my opinion, as a statistical production number. Normally, you're going through at least one blocker, sometimes two, and you're taking down one of the best athletes on the other team. It is a very difficult thing to achieve, and these guys just make it look easy over and over. It's almost like they're racing. It's a game that they get to play every game. Uh, So I think C.J. Stroud's going to have his hands full as a freshman um, if we can get some pressure, and that hopefully should generate maybe some ill-advised throws, maybe something into coverage. Uh, It it should give us the best fighting chance, I think, that – uh, any team's going to have in the Big Ten uh, of taking out Ohio State. I still think I'm still I hate them, but I'm amazed. Ryan Day has not lost a Big Ten game since he became head coach at Ohio State. That's insane. I mean, it's a task for anyone to beat Ohio State, let alone Michigan. So um, if anyone can do it, I think it's us. But it's going to take our best game from every position group, and I think we all kind of knew that going into the season. That's typically how it goes, and you would have it no other way. I mean, everyone's got to make a play. Someone has to. And that's where it feels like to bring it back to Saturday. Uh, this was a bit of a graduation of sorts because we just haven't seen someone make a big play in a big moment like um, like we saw guys do on both sides of the ball. So, you know, I want to put you, I want to put you in that locker room right now. So, obviously, Michigan State a couple weeks ago was extremely tough, something that was very hard to move past. They they had the players only meeting. They came out, they did what they did to Indiana, and you move forward. But they're still, in the back of the head, there's still probably something like, you know, we let another one slip away again. Is this like what we're destined to do? And you come out Saturday against Penn State, and the charge happens again in the fourth quarter. You're down. You're trailing. (coughs) Someone needs to make a play. The fact that they saw themselves do that, um, and they experienced that as a team, do you feel like that's something that adds fuel to, you know, fuel to the the idea that, you know what, um, you know, this Ohio State game is not a death march for for us like it like it's been for the last couple of Michigan teams. Like we've been through everything, we've seen everything, we've seen now that we can stay calm and poised and make these plays in winning time. How important do you think? I mean, you don't want to you got to score more than twenty one points a couple weeks from now, but in a game like this where it was just as Jim Harbaugh likes to call it a football fight. Just how important for the like how important a culture win was this for them? A huge culture win. I think that's a great way to put it. Huge culture win because these negative stigmas that have been around Harbaugh in the programs of of late, and it's it's got to start feeling more like you're in control if you're in that locker room. You're more in control of how games go, what the outcomes are like, that type of thing, as opposed to you know this is just our uh you know this is this is what our normal pattern of behavior is we're we're not even in control we lose these games because that's what we do we're that's our identity we don't make this play because that's what we do that's our identity and these are all opportunities that you know in this penn state game you know come back from behind in the fourth quarter march it downfield for a win check that box we've done it before we can do it again there's all sorts of instances like that in situations where you know positive outcome negative outcome and unfortunately negative outcome has happened in the big games on the road especially so now that we've checked some of those boxes uh you can play with a little bit more confidence not only that but me myself coming from a team that went three and nine and got beat on by pretty much everybody in the big 10 in 2008 uh, to a 10-win team in 2011 one of the things we continue to tell each other all the time and in any game, because we were down a lot, was we've had our asses kicked before. 
It's nothing new. We've been, we've lost by 30. We've lost by 40. We've lost by 50. It, it's all happened. So there's nothing really to be afraid of. Who, who cares? Go in, throw your best shots and, and hope you come away with it. Cause you know, if you liken it to a UFC fight, you go into a UFC fight knowing that you're going to lose. And so you don't throw any punches, you're going to lose, but go throw some punches, uh, see what connects. And, and um, who, who knows? We might be there in the fourth quarter. That's all I want from this Ohio state game is to have a chance near the end of the game. Let us be there. And then we'll see what happens. Well, before they get to Ohio State, there is a game this weekend against Maryland. We don't need to. Uh, we can go to mashups and things like that. But, you know, this is a very important week for Michigan. Uh, not only, like I said, they don't completely control their own destiny. They have to scoreboard watch a little bit. So I do want to get your thoughts quickly on, um, you know, Michigan State and Ohio State are going to play on Saturday. And obviously, Michigan, uh, Michigan needs an Ohio State win, which is so dirty and, and painful to have to say, but when you lose to Michigan state, you don't control your own destiny anymore. So I guess early thoughts from you on, on that matchup. And, you know, I think all of us kind of assume that Ohio state will win, but based on what you saw from Michigan state a couple of weeks ago, when Michigan played them, how do you feel about that matchup? The one thing I don't feel good about, um, I mean, I, I don't like that. We have to root for Ohio state, obviously, but uh, moving past that, I don't know that Michigan State's secondary in back four, back five are going to be able to slow down C.J. Stroud and those receivers. I don't know that they have the pass rush necessary to apply the pressure to Stroud to make him speed up his clock. Um, you know, when uh, – what's the guy's name, number three from uh, Purdue? Luke uh, – I can't remember. David Bell? Anyway, Bell, thank you. I don't know why I want to say Luke, but <laughs> Bell. Uh, Bell, he's probably the best receiver outside of Dotson in the Big Ten, and he tore him up. You know, he tore Michigan State secondary up, and they even knew where they're going to him, and they still tore him up. Now you've got to defend the weapons that Ohio State has in your secondary. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to go. One thing I do like is that Kenneth Walker, we get to see what one of the best running backs in the Big Ten can get going against the Ohio State defense because I think that's one of the biggest question marks. Excuse me. Is uh, – Ohio State's defense, because when they first came out this year, they were st they were struggling. Let's just put it how it was. They were struggling for the first three games of the year. So it'll be interesting to see what can Kenneth Walker generate, because obviously we're going to copy a little bit of that game plan as Michigan uh, the next week. So if Kenneth Walker can get going against Ohio State, that kind of gives us the indication and the nudge that, hey, we might be able to you know run our offense the way we run a run it with Haskins, potentially Quorum, who knows. But uh, – uh, it'll be a great measuring stick to see how good is Michigan State, how good is Ohio State, and also give us some great film moving into that game. Ideal scenario, film-wise, to move into that last game of the season. Yeah, and like we've said before, whoever winds up winning the Big Ten East is going to earn it. But maybe you're catching – I mean, you'll never catch Ohio State on a down week. But, you know, their stretch to end the year was Penn State, Purdue, Michigan State, Michigan. So that's – Again, if Ohio State's able to to run through and, and run through the table again and win the Big Ten, they will have earned it. Um, just a quick little note on maybe some some postseason destinations for Michigan. I would I would think that with an Ohio State win over Michigan State and getting this game Saturday against Maryland, which you know I think I can't say a hundred percent guarantee, but I think I can ninety five percent guarantee it. Um, I think that that probably puts New Year's Six back. You know firmly in play for Michigan. They could be in the driver's seat for the Rose Bowl. I think Peach Bowls probably uh, would be next up on the list. But, you know, there's a scenario in play where, you know, that hap what happens for them happens, what needs to happen for them happens on Saturday. Maybe you play a, a, you know, a competitive, but kind of a bummer of a game against Ohio State. There's a chance that this team can still go to the Rose Bowl. So if, if the Ohio State game does not go, super well and Michigan doesn't come out with a win. Um, you know, there's still a lot on the line, a lot left to play for the rest of the year. So regardless, I think what Saturday's win does for Michigan, um, you know, win over Penn state is it kind of guarantees that it's, I can't say it guarantees a double digit win season. Cause again, you have to beat Maryland, but I think what it does do, do is set a very good foundation uh, for, for what's to come next. So, uh, I think that's going to do it for us, Ryan. Do you have any other final thoughts about this game and this week uh, before we get out of here? Not really. I mean, I'm excited. I know we can't count the chickens before they've hatched, but 10-win season. Harbaugh's had, what, one other 10-win season so far this year in his tenure? Has he had a 10-win season? I thought maybe 16. He's actually had three of them. Uh, 2015, 2016, 2018. But, of course, 
those 2016 and 2018, um, you know, it didn't feel like seasons to hang your hat on because of the way they ended, but it has yeah. happened before, well, but this feels like it would be a little bit different. Yeah, regardless, it's nice to be there. 10 wins is a big number. Double digit wins is a big number. Something that you can feel good about, especially after not knowing what the COVID year was like. So uh, as much as we have talked about East Lansing, I'm ready to actually bury it permanently and let's move past it uh, and be excited about the 10 win season. What's coming for us at the end of the season. No one thought that it would be this significant at the end of the season. You'd be lying if you said you were. So I'm just excited to see how everything shakes out. It's going to be fun to be excited about competing in the Ohio state game because it's no fun when you know, you're not going to compete in that game. So I'm pumped about that and let's take care of Maryland. So it means all of what it would mean, you know, when we're 10 wins and going into that game. Well, you take care of Maryland. You set up exactly what I think I, the the barrel the baseline expectation for Michigan is: is that your your game against Ohio State should be for the Big Ten East title. Um, mm-hmm. You need a little bit of help for that to happen. Uh, have to kind of feel dirty and, and put on your your you know at least give a thumbs up to the Scarlet and Gray. See if they can get it done this weekend. But um, pretty impressive turnaround, uh, both in the on field results and how this team has looked. Um, from a mentality, from a culture standpoint, all of those things. So uh, that's going to do it for us. Uh, you can, please, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, subscribe using the um, the button below. If you're listening on the podcast, uh, please leave us a, a good review. Uh, leave us some good feedback. We always love hearing from you guys. Um, the Wolverine.com is on the On3 network now, so you can sign up for a year subscription for only a dollar. I don't need to give you the big sales pitch there. You know it's a good deal. If you haven't signed up yet, you're just maybe you're just being a little bit lazy. But whatever we can do to get you on board, let us know. So uh, for Ryan Van Bergen, I'm Anthony Brew. Michigan wins 21-17 in Week 11. Their goals are still ahead of them. We'll see what happens next week against Maryland.